Today's brew talk is all about how do you really know when your brew is finished fermenting? Now, this is a question that we get like all the time. Okay. I see it in our VIP group. I see it on the channel. People are always asking, well, how do I know? How can I tell if it's done? Well, it sounds really simple on the surface and it is actually a simple thing, but there's a few caveats to it. So I have some notes here, believe it or not, I took notes and I'm going to read some stuff to you and we're going to go from there. The first thing is, knowing is half the battle gi joe right you know we all saw that as kids and if you didn't well then you're just not as old as i am i'm sorry but anyway you need to know the tolerance of your yeast that's the alcohol tolerance you want to know your specific gravity of your must at the beginning and you need to know the specific gravity at the end once you know all those things that is the key to knowing what your must is really doing okay and it is important it's not just about knowing your ABV taking gravity readings. It's not just about that. You really do want to understand this stuff. And if you want to make it as a brewer, no matter what level you are, if you want to you know, improve, you want to understand the concepts and the science behind brewing, right? So this is just a basic primer for this. But um, let me explain what I mean. Number one, let me read. Any yeast can make a dry or sweet mead, cider, or wine given the right conditions. This is a fact. So all the hooey about, yeah, that's right, I said hooey, about sweet mead yeast or dry wine yeast is just that. It's just hooey. It's all crap. It's bull. It doesn't mean anything. The two factors that determine the alcohol content in your brew are A, how much sugars or fermentables there are, and B, how much alcohol your yeast can tolerate before going dormant. So you can make a dry mead with a sweet wine, sweet mead yeast, and you can make a sweet wine with a dry wine yeast. See the difference? Um, anyway, so if you have a, just for example, 15% tolerant yeast and your potential alcohol, like the fermentables, is 18%, it's not likely to go dry and it will probably remain sweet. Conversely, if you use a higher tolerance, say an 18% yeast with the same potential alcohol, meaning the same amount of fermentables as you did for the other one, it could and will likely just go dry. Something that a lot of people don't think about and don't realize is yeast are living things, and therefore they do not read and they don't follow the rules and laws set forth by us humans, and they sometimes just do as they like and can go higher or lower than expected due to a million factors, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Point number two, the amount of fermentables, be it sugar, honey, fruit, agave, invert sugar, dextrose, maltose, or what have you that is fermentable, is the first huge factor in deciding the alcohol content of your brew. Generally speaking, one pound of sugars gives 0 0.046 specific gravity in a gallon of must, and honey gives 0 0.035. Maple syrup is a little bit lower than that, but it does vary quite a bit. Different sugars are all slightly different. What that means is one pound of that fermentable dissolved in a full gallon of must. That's the approximate numbers. They're not exact because these are all natural products, so there is some variance. What does this mean? It means those numbers give a rough estimate of how much alcohol can be produced per volume of must and fermentables. Yeast produce roughly equal amounts of CO2 and ethanol. This is according to several different sources, as well as hundreds of other compounds in smaller quantity when they ferment. So we have a relatively reliable way of calculating alcohol. That's what, what, what those numbers actually mean. Also, one other thing, yeast is yeast when it comes to producing alcohol. All Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the type of yeast used to make mead, wine, cider, and beer, produces roughly the same amounts of gases and alcohol, but other types of yeast might vary, but those are not generally used for brewing, okay? Included in this type of yeast are all the types of wine, mead, beer, and bread yeast types available for brewing and baking. That's right. Baker's or bread yeast is the same type of yeast as that used for brewing. In fact, that's how beer was originally made. And beer making and bread making share a long symbiotic relationship. The main differences in the different yeasts, including bread yeast versus yeast used for brewing, is mostly in flocculation, which is the way things fall out of suspension at the end, the way the leaves form at the bottom, um, how well it can clear, things like that. And some flavor profiles. Various yeasts are used to produce various different profiles and work under different conditions, different temperatures, things like that. Bread yeast, baker's yeast, they aren't generally so specific. They're made for making bread. Can they make a wine? Sure. But 
Also, generally speaking, most brewers find two or three yeasts that they like, use them over and over, getting more accustomed to how they react and honing in on methods to get the best results from them. Like for me, I like to use 71B. Um, I'll, I'm experimenting with a couple others, but 71B is like my favorite. It can do almost anything I need. US04 is another really good one for making ales or lower ABV brews. Just a really good all around yeast for lower ABV. Now, point number three, the next step in what you need to know. Alcohol tolerance of the yeast is the high water mark, you might say, for how much alcohol can be produced. Now, the tolerance won't matter at all if you make lower gravity brews, but let me explain. The alcohol tolerance is the level at which the yeast say, nope, we're not going to ferment anymore. We're going to go dormant. Notice I didn't say die. They don't actually die. The only way to kill yeast is with high heat. Pasteurization kills them. Um, even fortifying doesn't necessarily kill them. It puts them to sleep. It makes them go dormant. Um, all other forms of stabilization other than pasteurization actually don't kill the yeast. They impair their ability to reproduce or build a colony or ferment but they don't actually kill them. But by lower gravity, what I mean is below like 1.100. Nearly any commercial yeast will ferment that with the exception of some ale yeast, like US04, like I was saying, will not actually ferment out past 11 or 12%. Most beers and ciders fall into the sub 1080 range, 1.080, which comes to about 10 to 11%. Um, and even USO4 ale yeast will normally ferment that out dry. So if you're using below like 1.080 or 1.070, almost any yeast is going to be able to ferment that dry. More on that in a little bit. But anyway, the gist is, even if you gave the yeast all the fermentals for, say, 20% alcohol, if the yeast aren't bred to go past 12%, you're not going to get 20%. Um, and if you only have fermentables enough to make, say, 5% alcohol, using 12%, 15%, or 18% tolerant yeast will not give you more alcohol. That's a big stickling point with a lot of newer brewers. They seem to say, well, I'm using an 18% yeast. Yeah, but you only used one pound of sugar in a gallon. There's just no way you're going to make 18% alcohol from one pound of sugar. Vice versa, putting in 10 pounds of sugar and using almost any yeast, you're still not going to get the amount of alcohol that that amount of sugar has the potential to produce. And I say potential because it's only potential in that when that is fermented, it can become alcohol. So... Just because there's the potential there doesn't mean it's actually going to happen. The yeast has to actually make that happen. Some guidelines to help. Just to simplify things. So you made a mustard wort. It's been a period of time, be it days, weeks, or even months. And you notice much less activity in the airlock. You are using airlocks, right? Or in the must itself. It's time to check gravity. You take a reading, then take a note. Wait one week and repeat. Let me say that again. You take a reading, you write it down. You wait a week, you take another reading, you write it down. You need two readings. For good habit's sake, even if your reading seems like it's done, take a second anyway. That week will not have any detrimental effect on your brew. Say it with me. Time heals all brews. Now you have those two readings. If the first is higher than the second, your brew is still fermenting albeit possibly very slowly, okay? Just something to keep in mind. Give it more time. A week, a few weeks, it doesn't matter. Once you get two identical readings over at least a week, it's finished and it's ready to rack. Now, I know I'm saying time doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Many people are quick to want to get it off those leases and get it, get it racked and get it, but it's not done yet. If it's not finished, there's no point in get, taking it off the lease. Much of your active colony is still in that lease and still in suspension within the, the solution. There's no reason to remove it. There's a myth that people say, oh, if I leave it a few days, it's going to change the flavors. No, no, it, you can sit on lease for months with most meads and it's not a problem. In beer making, in very low gravity beer making, it is possible for it to alter it. But that's because of the low alcohol content. It can alter flavors very quickly. Most meads and wines being you know, eight, nine, 10%, 12%, whatever, they're not going to be as affected so quickly. I have things that I've left in primary fermentation for six, eight months, and it was not a problem. I left them in the secondary or conditioning phase for another six, eight months or a year sometimes. No problem. I didn't get any weird off flavors. There's no rush. The only thing that's going to happen is it's going to get better. All meads, all wines get better with time. 
Now, some caveats to all of this. This is how you can actually understand what's happening. In most cases, assuming a typical fermentation scenario, your final reading should be somewhere around 1.000. A little higher sometimes, even lower sometimes, totally fine, as long as you know your original gravity and yeast alcohol tolerance. For instance, I know there's a lot of math here, but I do have a really simple way to figure this out coming at the end of the video that you don't even really need to worry about so much math. Just stay tuned, but it's good to understand this stuff too, and I hope it's not too much you know, rapid fire numbers thrown at you all at once. But anyway, let's say I used a 15% alcohol tolerance yeast and I have a 1.100 original gravity. It doesn't matter if it's mead, wine, cider, whatever. After some time, my two readings that I take after it's done are both 1.000, right? It's finished fermenting, everything is good. If it were lower than 1.000, that's all fine too. It just means that, you know, it went beyond 1.00. It's all good though. That's the point. It is done fermenting. It's safe. It's stable. Okay. But what if my reading was say 1.020 or even higher? Well, let's do the math. If ABV equals your original gravity minus your final gravity multiplied by 135, then we have 1.100 minus 1.0200 for 0 0.080, which is 80 points of gravity times 135 gives us an ABV of 10.8%, okay? That's the important thing to remember here. It's 10.8%. That means we haven't reached the yeast tolerance because remember, we used a 15% yeast for this example. So there's still sugars left. So if there's still sugars left and it hasn't reached the yeast tolerance, that means it's stalled. That's exactly what a stall is, is when there's still sugars left and you have not hit the tolerance of your yeast yet. Um, stalls happen for many reasons and are often difficult to overcome. Um, that's a whole other video. The easiest method, though, is to dilute your must a little bit, which means either split it. In this case, I wouldn't split it. I might just, you know, pour some of it off and pour a little bit more water into it to dilute it slightly. That can sometimes kick it back in, or you can also add yeast or do both of those things. But that's a whole other video. So as you can see, even with a typical setup, you can have an unfinished or stalled brew, even with a semi-reasonable number as your final gravity. 1.020 doesn't seem too bad. But when you think about it, if you understand what you're working with, that was a stall. But without readings and the yeast tolerance, we wouldn't know for sure. Now, one thing I want to be clear on, I've had people say, oh, I am at 1.002. I have a stall. What should I do? Okay, if you have 1.002 two weeks in a row and you know that you're pretty close to the, you know, you're not past the tolerance of the yeast, more than likely you just have something unfermentable in there, which can happen. There are non-fermentable uh, sweetener density things that are in honeys and in some sugars and in different um, compounds that you could have added to your brew. Don't worry about it. That's not really a stall. That's just actually finished. There's there's nothing to worry about. Two points or four points, not even anything to be worried about. But let's look at another situation. So we just did a, a very typical simple mead that was stalled. Let's look at this though. Let's say you have a starting gravity of 1.160. This is often done when someone just wants to make more alcohol. It's often problematic with our natural brewing techniques, and that's why we tend to avoid such high gravities because they do stall readily. But let's say you did it. That's enough fermentables to make 21.6% alcohol content under the right conditions. Now, let's use that same 15% yeast, right? And let's even give the yeast some benefit of the doubt. They worked overtime. They went beyond, they went above and beyond the job. They went to 17%. I mean, they can't read after all 15, 17. What do they know, right? So they actually got it to 17% ABV. Your original gravity was 1.160 and your final gravity is 1.034. Sounds kind of high, right? I mean, common sense says that it's stalled. So it's at 1.034. It must be a stall. But no. Actually, the brew is completely finished fermenting. If you want that to go dry, you have to either add a stronger yeast or dilute that brew because you've reached the alcohol tolerance of that yeast and there's still sugars left. So it didn't stall. The yeast actually went further than they probably should have. It might have might stop way higher than 1.034. But even in that case, it's still too sweet but it's not stalled, it's actually finished. So you wanna know the difference between a stall and you just happen to have too much sugars in there for the yeast so that you can take the appropriate action.
Once you have that high of an ABV though, it's harder to get it to ferment further. So you probably would have to dilute it a bit and add yeast and that's, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, it's yeast. They don't want to swim in their own poop any more than you and I do. So, you know, more alcohol makes it harder to keep going. So summary, how do you know if your brew's done? One, you know your yeast. Two, you know your starting gravity. Three, you know your final gravity with two identical readings a week apart. When you put it all together, it's pretty easy to know if it's really done or not. Too much math? I got you covered. Don't you worry. Let's use the KISS method. Now, I don't like to call anyone or anything stupid. So in my case, I like to say it's keep it seriously simple. For this, use a yeast that is made for wine or mead and avoid ale yeast. This is basically uh, a rule of thumb, okay? You're going to choose a yeast. Just don't choose an ale yeast. Choose a wine yeast or a mead yeast, and you're fine. Most of them are going to have at least an 11 to 12% tolerance, and this will work. And that, that way, no matter what yeast you use, it's going to be fine. Make sure your original gravity is no higher than 1.080. That's right. I said that. 1.080. That's still going to make like an 11.5 to 12% alcohol content in your meat or wine, which is totally acceptable. We make those all the time. And I actually really like the 11 to 12% alcohol range for most meat. It really makes it taste nice. Um, but you can rest assured that it's going to end right around that 1.000 mark. Ending any, well, oh, did I have too much and did it stall? Or did I not have enough and it's actually too much or, you know... You don't have to worry about it. If you maintain that kind of yeast, which is another reason why a lot of people stick to just a couple different types of yeast to keep it simple so that they can predict it and know what's to come. And the other way is keep your gravity a little bit lower. A, your yeast will thank you because they won't have to struggle quite so hard once it starts to get to those higher numbers. And B, you know it should end around the dry mark, 1.000. That way, it's repeatable, it's consistent, you don't have to think as hard, you don't need to do as many calculations, and it just makes life work a little better. If only all things in life were quite that simple. Oh, and with that method, if you want more alcohol, just drink two glasses. By the way, you see these people over here? That's our VIP club. That's our bejesus and plaid members. This is the people that keep this channel going, those and all the other VIPs. And if you want to become a VIP and get your name in lights, there's a link in the description below. But if you like this video, look up. There's another one up there. You might like that one too. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.